Next slide, please. So the uh, committee has been able to um, uh, assemble a, <clears throat> a group of uh, 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 resource speakers for today's presentation. So you can see the faculty consists of uh, uh, the lead uh, researcher or implementers or uh, stakeholders who are involved in uh, uh, improving access uh, to uh, IUDs and IUS, uh, both in the US as well as in uh, uh, low and middle income countries. Next slide. And uh, as you can see that uh, uh, the agenda to cover the, uh, 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 the session takes a look at two examples coming from the US when it comes to uh, 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 IUDs. And then we also have one example from uh, uh, nine uh, countries in low and middle income uh, uh, region of uh, Asia and Africa that's going to be presented in terms of uh, expanding access using the postpartum family planning mode. And then this session is going to have a mini round table uh, uh, type of panel that's going to take a look at one exciting development uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, low and middle income countries. Though LNG IUS has been available for over 30 years, in uh, the rest of the world, uh, uh, it's relatively new, particularly in the public sector. And so we're going to hear uh, uh, voices from uh, uh, stakeholders as well as a field uh, uh, provider and program implementer talk about uh, this exciting development on uh, uh, improving or expanding the method choice available to women and girls who are interested in uh, long acting reversible contraception. Next slide. So uh, uh, for those who have participated in previous uh, uh, sessions, the first two, I think most of us are familiar that the symposium was created to provide a platform that's specific and focused to discussing uh, IUDs developments, as well as learnings, as well as gaps in research and, and program implementation experiences, as well as a host of other things that would uh, uh, support and promote the agenda for safe and effective use of uh, uh, intrauterine uh, uh, devices with the hope that we can support uh, the current providers and researcher, as well as foster the next generation of leaders who would continue to expand uh, access to family planning in general, as well as to um, uh, long acting reversible contraception, particularly IUDs and IUS. Our specific objectives would, would be looking at uh, exemplars of programs improving access uh, in the US uh, in low middle income countries, as well as to take a look at uh, uh, programs uh, that are supporting expanding even the uh, uh, LNG IUS into low and middle income uh, countries. Next slide. The, uh, can you go? Uh, the, uh, for those who are participating in order to also secure accreditation, I think that uh, the requirements for completing the evaluation is going to be made available towards the end of this uh, session. Uh, by completing the course evaluation. Next slide. Uh, the next two slides are just going to take a look at, uh, uh, show you, uh, uh, demonstrate that the disclosures of the faculty. Next slide, as well as the coordinating uh, committees. Next slide. And uh, before I hand over uh, uh, this. Uh, 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 introduction to uh, Dr. Tessa Madden from the Choice Project. I'd like to acknowledge our grantors as well as uh, sponsors to make this uh, uh, event uh, a reality. Uh, the other part I'd I, I miss in, in uh, noting is, of course, that one is so my name is Ricky and I'm one of the coordinating committee. And last but not the least, uh, uh, before I hand it over to Dr. Madden, is to note that. Uh, uh, the way the session is going to be managed is that the question and answer will be handled at the end of uh, uh, the first, pres first three presentations. Uh, we'll have enough time for questions that will be put into the question and answer box that will come up 
uh, as we end uh, the third uh, presentation. Uh, and then we'll have a five minute bio break. And then we go into the uh, round table mini panel type of uh, discussion. Uh, uh, and then the same uh, setup will be, uh, uh, we'll, we will have the same setup for question and answer at the end of the uh, uh, round table. With that one, uh, uh, let me hand the floor over to Dr. Madden. Dr. Madden. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I suppose, depending on your time zone. Um, I am Tessa Madden. I'm an obstetrician, gynecologist, and clinical researcher at Washington University in St. Louis. And I am very pleased to be here today to provide a brief overview, overview of the Contraceptive Choice Project um, for the today's IUD symposium session on increasing access to IUDs in the US and lower and middle income countries. Um, the Choice Project was based in the US in St. Louis, Missouri. Next slide, please. And just as a reminder, um, when we're talking about long acting reversible contraception or LARC in the US, oh, back up, what's the end? Um, then we're talking about the levonorgestrel IUD, the copper IUD, and the edenogestrel implant. Next slide, please. So this slide shows IUD use in the US from 1960 to 2008. Um, and I think it's important to put the Choice Project sort of into historical context. Um, can you click, Rachel? Thanks. Um, so the idea for the Choice Project emerged in 2006 and enrollment began in 2007. And at that time, the contraceptive mix in the US looked different than it does now, um, with IUD users only accounting for 5.5% of um, contraceptive use. And part of the impetus for the Choice Project um, and other projects that were designed to increase access was really a recognition that this low IUD use might reflect um, barriers such as the high upfront cost of the method, um, lack of insurance payment for um, IUDs, um, persistent negative misconceptions and myths that existed about IUDs for both patients um, and clinicians and also limited patient knowledge. Next slide, please. So this just shows the contraceptive mix um, from 2008. And you can see that the most commonly used contraceptive methods in the US at the time were oral contraceptives, female sterilization, um, and male condoms with again, IUD use accounting for about 5%. Um, and implant use was, is, was very low and is in this um, red bar at the bottom of 1.5%. Next slide, please. So the Contraceptive Choice Project was a research um, study um, that provided over 9,000 women um, in the St. Louis area with the, with the reversible contraceptive method of choice um, at no out-of-pocket cost. Um, all participants received information about common reversible methods, um, and they received same-day initiation of contraception when medically appropriate. Um, and participants were followed for two to three years um, to measure outcomes such as continuation, satisfaction, and pregnancy. Next slide, please. The objectives of the research project were to increase the use of long-acting reversible contraception, or LARC, among reproductive age women, um, specifically by removing financial barriers and increasing patient access. In addition, it, we, um, you know, the goal was to measure satisfaction and continuation across a variety of contraceptive methods so including IUDs and implants. Next slide, please. So this um, slide just shows the study inclusion criteria. Um, participants had to have been a reproductive age. They had to primarily live either in St. Louis city or county. They had to be sexually active with a male partner or plan to be so soon. They had to desire to avoid pregnancy in the next 12 months. They had to desire a reversible method of contraception and they had to be willing um, to either initiate a new contraceptive method or switch if they were currently using an existing method. Next slide, please. So the Choice Project um, used a structured approach to educate participants about reversible contraceptive methods. This consisted of a standardized script, um, which was presented to participants by research assistants. Um, and the script used a tiered framework meaning that methods were presented in order of effectiveness. The rationale for using a script was that the contraceptive education or counseling was primarily provided by non-clinicians who had a variable background in reproductive health. 
Um, so the idea was to really be able to train people to present um, this information in a standardized approach so that participants were receiving the same information. And while there have been a number of concerns raised about using um, a tier-based framework um, for contraceptive counseling, um, the Choice Project um, Counseling or Education also utilized a patient-centered framework called the GATHER framework, which we used to develop rapport with participants and really center the interaction on the patient need. Next slide, please. So now I'm just gonna present some of the main findings from the Choice Project. Next slide. So this shows the overall breakdown of contraceptive methods in the Choice Project. And you can see that IUD uptake was high with 46% of women um, choosing a levonorgestrel IUD and 12% choosing a copper IUD. And if we look at LARC methods overall, next, Rachel. You can see that 75% of participants chose um, a method of long-acting reversible contraception. Next slide, please. And I'm just gonna present some data about continuation and satisfaction. Next slide, please. So um, if we look here at 12 months, this shows both continuation and satisfaction by methods. Um, and you can see that continuation for both of the IUDs was high um, with 87% for, um, I don't know that you can see my cursor, but 87% for hormonal IUDs and 84% for copper IUDs. If we look at continuation overall for any of the LARC methods, um, can you click Rachel, please? I forgot that I wasn't gonna have control over my animations. Um, the continuation for any LARC method was 86% compared to 54% for the shorter acting methods such as pills, patch, ring, and um, Depo-Provera or the injectable contraceptives. In addition, um, the percentage of people who reported being very satisfied was high for IUD and implant users. Rachel, can you click, click please? With 66% of LARC users reporting being very satisfied compared to 42% of non-LARC users. Next slide, please. And this slide just shows um, continuation at 12 and 24 months stratified by age. So um, on the top half of the graph, you can see the continuation for adolescents compared to um, adult users by LARC and non-LARC methods. The adolescents are in the red bar and adult users are in the blue bar. And the rates of continuation for LARC methods were similar um, between adolescents and adult users at 12 months. And then the bottom half of the graph shows again, LARC um, and non-LARC and then adolescent users are in the orange bar and adult users are with the purple bar. And again, the rates of continuation were similar. Um, and this analysis was done specifically because there had been concerns that um, younger users, particularly adolescents, might be less likely to continue these methods compared to adult women, which we did not find. Next slide, please. Okay, and so I'm gonna just um, present a little bit of data about the contraceptive effectiveness in the project. Next slide. So here you can see the rates of unintended pregnancy stratified by method. Um, the blue bars show LARC methods, the orange bars show um, depomedroxy progesterone acetate or depo-provera, and the green bars show um, oral contraceptive pills, the patch and the ring. And you can see that over the three years that we followed participants, um, the risk of an unattended pregnancy was significantly higher with the shorter acting methods than it was um, compared with LARC methods. Next slide, please. And this shows um, a similar ana analysis, but stratified by age. So at the top of the graph um, with the red and blue lines, you can see the risk of um, unintended pregnancy among LARC users. Um, age less than 21 and age 21 and older compared to those um, participants who were using oral contraceptives, patch or ring, where the risk of an unintended pregnancy was actually twofold higher among those users than women who were less than age 21. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and so here I'm just gonna um, show some of our results about pregnancy. Next slide. 
So this um, shows the pregnancy outcomes for choice participants um, compared to U US women overall. Um, and so this shows the rates for pregnancy in the top line. Um, and there was about a 63% reduction in pregnancy overall um, for choice project um, participants compared to US rate, which is not surprising given that one of the inclusion criteria was that women had to um, plan to avoid pregnancy for at least a year. Um, the middle line shows the rate of unintended pregnancy for choice participants compared to the overall US rate. And we saw about a 43% reduction in the rate of unintended pregnancies. And then if we look at abortion rates in the bottom line, that um, rate for choice women compared to uh, the US overall was again, about a 40% reduction. So we did see um, significant rates reductions in both overall pregnancy rates um, and unintended pregnancy rates. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and so in summary, the main findings from the Choice Project really were that um, the uptake of LARC methods um, was high. That these methods were associated with higher um, continuation and satisfaction when compared to shorter acting methods. Um, and that we saw an increase um, typical use effectiveness and lower rates of unintended pregnancy with LARC methods compared to the shorter acting methods. Um, and, you know, not, not necessarily unexpected, um, but had not necessarily been de demonstrated in a large cohort beforehand. Um, and so I will stop there and turn it over to the next presenter and then happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. I'll, I'll go ahead. So my name is Anita Makins. Um, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist uh, in the UK. I'm a senior lecturer at Oxford University um, and a consultant here in the trust. And I also uh, directed the FIGO PPIUD initiative. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Next slide, please. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with FIGO, but in case you're not, I put a little slide in. So FIGO is the International Federation of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, we've got 132 member societies around the world. So these are national societies of obstetricians and gynecologists. And um, FIGO is dedicated to the improvement of women's health and rights and to the reduction of disparities um, in healthcare available to women and newborns sort of across, across the globe. Uh, the PPIUD initiative was FIGO's largest uh, completed project to date. Um, and I'll go on to, to tell you about that. Next slide, please. So maybe first to explain the rationale behind, you know, why FIGO invested so much time and energy into this. So uh, we were very, very convinced by the argument for, for postpartum family planning. So there are huge disparities in maternal mortality ratios. Um, throughout the world, uh, when we compare, you know, countries like Sierra Leone with a maternal mortality ratio of sort of 1,100 per 100,000, and then you, then you compare to places like the US with 19 per 100,000, you know, massive disparities. And then contraception has been identified as uh, having the potential of reducing maternal mortality by 30%. Um, and we know that the unmet need in the postpartum period, particularly in low middle income countries, is, is high. So uh, there's a study quoting it as high as 48 um, percent. And there's also plenty of evidence to demonstrate that uh, shortening uh, birth to pregnancy intervals um, has considerable health benefits, benefits for women. So you've got the graph on the right showing there reduced rates of miscarriage, low birth weight, maternal death and, and preterm birth. Um, and so unsurprisingly, the WHO recommendation is that we should be waiting 24 months between pregnancies um, in order to, to reduce these risks. Um, and also just sort of jumping on the bandwagon a little bit that actually uh, institutional birth, so giving birth in hospital, these rates are increased, have increased quite considerably um, in low middle income countries. So it sort of gives rise to this opportunity to provide more than just a safe birth. Next slide, please. The last sort of uh, 
quite huge benefit that some people aren't aware of is that um, this is a study in 2008 by Rutstein. So it's quite old evidence, but it, it's sitting there. And it, he basically showed, looking at demographic health surveys of different low-middle income countries, when he pulled all that data together, what he demonstrated, or what they demonstrated was that um, there was a direct correlation between um, interval in months between birth to conception and the child being alive uh, and undernourished. And so the longer women wait and the bigger the gap between pregnancies, the more likely those children were to be alive. It went on further to extrapolate that and said, and said that actually if people increase the, the uh, rates between uh, the timing between births to 24 months, you'd have you divert uh, 89, so 893,000 deaths of under fives. Um, and if that was increased further to 36 months, that you'd add and uh, avert another 943,000 deaths. So, so hugely significant um, and uh, very impactful. Next slide, please. So why, why PPIUD in particular? Um, so it can be inserted immediately um, after birth as a one-stop procedure. So baby's delivered, placenta comes out. And if the lady's been counseled properly before and have consented in advance, then the, PP, the IUD can, can be inserted as, as one procedure. Um, it's medical eligibility criteria category one, which makes it much simpler uh, to, um, to use, particularly low middle income countries, there's no concerns with sort of other issues. Um, after the six week check, women don't necessarily have to return. Um, very often in low middle income countries, people are traveling very long distances um, and, and, and find it difficult to come back at six weeks to then start talking about contraception. Um, there's no ongoing need for, for commodities. So once the IUD is inserted, if the lady's happy with it, then it can stay in there, depending on the type, up to 10 years. Um, and then it's also very cost effective. I've got some slides later on where, where I'll discuss that in a bit more depth. And next slide, please. So just briefly what we did. So we started in 2013 um, and uh, it was the pilot project in Sri Lanka um, to 2015. And then in 2015, we had phase two where we expanded to uh, five other countries, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Kenya, and Tanzania. And then in phase three, um, we continued in the six countries and it was what we called the sustainability phase, but it was sort of trying to ensure that um, the countries would be able to continue the work that they'd started um, once FIGO uh, was no longer supporting them. So we worked through the national societies, they were the lead implementers in each of the countries, and then the aim was to integrate PPIUD services into routine clinical practice. So that was both counselling uh, about family planning methods in general, whichever was available in, in each country, and, and then PPIUD insertion because that was the skill that was missing. So um, it was implemented in 48 referral hospital, hospitals that were selected uh, with a large maternity unit, so they tended to be big referral centres, and we did also uh, include some peripheral sites that fed into the, the larger hospitals. Next slide, please. So this was our theory of change. So we worked in, uh, in sort of leadership and governance. So we were making sure that the uh, national societies were engaged with their ministries of health, sort of advocating for contraception, in particular postpartum family planning, and that they were in the driving seat of it. Uh, Workforce-wise, we trained um, a huge number of health practitioners. We also uh, included pre-service training uh, so, that the, so that the changes were sustainable and we focused also on task sharing in, in many of the countries. In terms of service delivery, um, I mentioned before, focusing also on similar to the previous speaker on, on a sort of balanced counselling of all methods that were available in country. Um, and there was also a demand side uh, intervention which was producing, we had um, different IAC materials, so uh, information education and communication, pamphlets, videos, uh, etc. And we also worked with community health volunteers, uh, particularly in, in Nepal and in Kenya. And then data wise, we did at the start have our own data uh, system with sort of feedback loops, loops and we had data safety monitoring boards set up 
and uh, regular audits of structure and process and so on. Um, but actually, in, by phase three, we were working through the HMIS systems only in the country, and we worked towards making sure that postpartum family planning indicators were included in the H HMIS systems. Um, and so the idea was that with all of that, we were improving the health system so that it could pro provide PPIUD, PPFP, PPIUD services, increasing modern contraceptive rates and better birth spacing, decreasing unintended pregnancies and unsafe abortions, and therefore ultimately reducing maternal mortality and improving perinatal outcomes. So that was our theory of change. Next slide, please. So in terms of our uh, the nitty gritty, sort of the insertion technique, we use the Kelly's forceps, so that's a long 33 centimeter long forceps to ensure a high fundal placement after normal vagina delivery and also taught people to insert IUD at cesarean section. Um, teaching was done uh, in classrooms using the Mama U, so uh, participants had to insert three to five uh, IUDs correctly on the Mama U. Uh, and then they would then go back to their, uh, their clinical scenarios and would need to insert a minimum of five, super, uh, five supervised insertions before they were considered able to, to, to go ahead and practice on their own. Next slide, please. So in terms of our achievements, just briefly, so we provide, we trained about 12,000, over 12,000 uh, healthcare providers in, in balance counselling, uh, which included community health workers, as I said, in the countries where it was appropriate, so about 1,600 uh, community health workers or volunteers. Um, about nine, over 9,000 uh, healthcare providers were trained in actual insert counselling and insertion. So that depended a little bit whether they were doctors, nurses, midwives, etc., depending on the different contexts. Um, so over 700,000 women received the counselling, and there was about a 12% uptake, uptake for PPIUDs. About 12% of ladies accepted it and then had PPIUD inserted. And you can see in the graph there on the right, Tanzania and Bangladesh were the two countries which we stayed in the longest, actually. So that explains why there were more um, cumulative providers trained there. Next slide, please. So this is uh, from one of our publications in the IJGO, and it's just demonstrating how it differed in the, in, in the countries as to who was actually doing the provision of care. So you can see there that in the African countries, Tanzania and Kenya, uh, the provision of IUD uh, or insertion of IUD was predominantly by midwives. Um, and then um, Nepal, India and Bangladesh, that varied a little bit, although Bangladesh and certainly in Sri Lanka, it was only the uh, IUDs were only inserted by doctors. Next slide, please. So um, we sort of capitalize or focus very much on, on task shifting or task sharing, we'd like to call it. Picture on the right are uh, who I call the super nurses from Kalyani in West Bengal. And what the graph is showing is that when uh, they were uh, taken on board in terms of training for IUD insertion, you can see that the accessibility to women was then much greater. And so in that hospital, suddenly, uh, you know, many women were, were receiving IUDs, which otherwise would not have had access to it because otherwise they, they needed to have seen a doctor. And, and in many countries, that, that's not going to happen if you just have a straightforward normal delivery. Uh, next slide, please. And this again is from one of the public, the IJGO publications. So um, you, it's just looking really at our expulsion and removal rate. So we followed up at six weeks. I think you need to tap it again, Rachel, to point out that, yeah. Uh, we followed up about 52% of women um, and our expulsion rates were quite low. So 2.6%, obviously we, we weren't following up and not everybody came back at six weeks. So we can only report on that 52%. Um, and it did vary a little bit from country to country, but we had a very good sort of feedback system where if expulsion rates were going up, then we would go back and find out who was inserting and whether there was an issue with uh, training or perhaps they had just started. So when a new batch of doctors or nurses came in in particular, uh, you know, when there were big rotations in country, then obviously the, then expulsion, expulsion rates would go up. So I think without the, the sort of overlooking the project, probably that would have been a little bit higher. Um, but, it, but nevertheless, with, everyone was doing it with the Kelly's forceps. I think that makes a big difference. And removal rates, Rachel, if you tap again, removal rates varied also between country. And we found that that was actually down to whether counselling was good. If counselling was done really properly, um, then women didn't tend to, we didn't tend to have high removal rates. Um, in Bangladesh, we had them at some point. And when we uh, 
got more counsellors counselor, on board, lay women counsellors on board to explain things properly, then removal rates went down because people were happy and understood why they were having it in the first place. Next slide, please. Um, we don't have a lot about long-term outcome. Uh, this is a study just recently published from, published, uh, from Tanzania. Um, so again, if you, if you press again, Rachel, um, our long-term follow-up, this, this was just a one-year telephone follow-up. And again, I think we managed to follow up just under 50% of ladies um, and 86% of them still had the IUD in situ. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted just to talk a little bit about cost effectiveness because we did some work on this and, and it was interesting to us. Um, these two graphs are looking at cost effectiveness. Uh, the one on the left is in the UK and the one on the right is, 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 is in the US. Um, and they're, they're not new publications, this is 2008 and 2009. But um, on the left, just to explain it very briefly, uh, was looking at the IUD um, after 10 years of of use um, and the square and the little star on the left represent a depot and the combined pill, so short acting methods. And you can see that compared to the, the copper coil, they are more expensive and less effective. Um, and then if we look at the two arrows, the one pointing down and pointing up that are completely black, those represent uh, the IUS and the implant. And you can see that they're slightly more effective, uh, but also more expensive. Um, and then on the right, this is a, an economic evaluation in the States. And again, um, it, looking at the duration of use, you can see that after sort of about two years, a copper, uh, copper coil um, is, is, the, is the, the most cost effective uh, method. So we were quite interested in that. And we wanted to see whether there was any sort of information about cost effectivity in low middle income countries. Uh, so next slide, please. So we did some work um, in Tanzania and Bangladesh. Uh, and some health economists helped us. And we, uh, this table is showing the costs of uh, rolling out the project as we did it um, in, so the first or the middle column is for Bangladesh. And so if we were to expand nationally at a national level and, and include all 36 facilities, um, then the estimated cost uh, was just under two million pounds. But then if you looked at the estimated direct healthcare costs that were saved due to the fact that, you know, a few unplanned pregnancies, maternal mortality, maternal morbidity, so um, near misses and so on, um, that actually you were saving the healthcare system over two and a half million dollars. Uh, so it's more, um, so it's cost effective basically. So you, you are gaining more than you're spending. And then similarly in Tanzania, Africa is always more expensive um, than, than Southeast Asia, but to, to roll it out in the entirety of Tanzania would cost just under seven million dollars. Um, and the but the estimated healthcare costs that we, would be saved through the intervention was just under eight million dollars. So so hugely cost effective uh, to roll out PPIUD in in those two countries. Next slide, please. And then I just put this one in, um, you know, in the context of the COVID pandemic, um, you know, the obstetric encounter has become a sort of golden opportunity. People don't want to come uh, to a hospital if they can avoid it. Um, and so when they come to give birth, we should be offering them more than just a safe birth and contraception should be part of the conversation. Um, and if it's done antenatally, even better. And if they want the IUD, it is possible to insert uh, the IUD using PPE correctly. And obviously uh, we need to make sure that uh, removal services are still available so that if people want them removed, women want them removing that that's also, that's also possible. Next slide, please. So just uh, to summarize, um, so addressing PPFP is vital to bridge the gap of the of unmet need for, for contraception and to reduce maternal mortality and improve child survival. PPIUD is safe and effective and has low expulsion, infection and perforation rates, according to uh, our, our uh, data. Uh, task shifting stroke sharing um, is safe and allows the method to be more accessible to women in, in LMICs. Um, and having this one-stop proced procedure is, is invaluable, uh, particularly when people find, if women find it so hard to come back for future appointments. And although we have little data on continuation rates, it's uh, the bit that we do have, it seems to suggest that, that women are happy with it and 86% of them still had it a year down the line. 
So thank you. I uh, just want to thank our, anon our anonymous donors. I think you can pop the next slide on, yeah. And that's the, just a photo of the huge, it was a huge amount of work for people all over the world participating. You can see there the emblems of the different national societies. The London School of Hygiene also helped us with our uh, data interpretation. Um, and um, thank you for uh, the governments of the six countries um, and the, the national societies and also our PPIUD team here at London headquarters. Thank you. Caitlin? <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Anita. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Quaid, <coughs> excuse me, the director of Family Planning Elevated, and it is an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so we've been this morning to St. Louis, we've been all around the globe with Figo's PPIUD work, and I now want to invite you on an all expense paid virtual field trip to Utah to learn about Family Planning Elevated, our statewide <coughs> initiative working to increase access to IUDs, to POPs, and everything in between. Next, please. Um, so a little orientation to the who, what, and where of Family Planning Elevated. We are located within the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and we are a team of clinicians, researchers, and program staff who provide contraception and abortion care, conduct clinical trials. Uh, we serve as a family planning fellowship site. And we are the folks behind two community level contraceptive initiatives, Family Planning Elevated, which I'll be talking about today, and the older, more petite sister of Family Planning Elevated, Her Salt Lake, which was the county level initiative that we undertook prior to FPE. Um, really, the, the crown jewel of FPE is our contraceptive access program, through which we've partnered with 28 clinics to expand and, and enhance contraceptive service delivery around the state. Um, these clinics are FQHCs, county health departments, and rural private practice clinics, all committed to providing care to underserved clients in their communities. We're also expanding the program to a limited number of clinics that look a little bit different from our traditional sites, uh, a rural hospital, an abortion clinic, a university campus clinic, and we call these beloved misfits our affiliate clinics. Um, so you can see uh, those, those stars represent each of our clinics um, and they might look a little lopsided, uh, but they are generally reflective of the distribution of Utah's 3 million-ish residents, um, most of whom <clears throat> are concentrated in the Salt Lake Valley and along the greater Wasatch Front. Next, please. So the mission statement of Family Planning Elevated, as you can see, it's very colorful, uh, but fairly simple. We believe that all people deserve equitable access to all contraceptive methods at all times and in all communities. And <clears throat> while it is a simple enough statement, uh, it is not so simple in practice. And I'd like to look at those first two <clears throat> elements, um, all people and all methods. Next, please. So to ensure that all people in Utah have access to contraception, we have to understand who's in the contraceptive coverage gap. These are the folks who are paying out of pocket for their contraceptive care uh, because they're uninsured, they're underinsured, undocumented, or have confidentiality concerns or other barriers. Next. So some Utahns qualify for public insurance, Medicaid, and just last year, Utah expanded Medicaid coverage to folks with incomes up to 138% federal poverty level, meaning that more Utahns than ever before can now get the contraceptive method they want, including those notoriously pricey IUDs through Medicaid without cost sharing. And on the other side of the spectrum, there are Utahns who may have insurance through their employer or marketplace health plan. And if that insurer abides by the ACA contraceptive mandate, then things are great and they can also access IUDs and the full range of methods without cost sharing. But this leaves over 100,000 Utahns um, who are having to pay out of pocket for their contraceptive services. And as you can see, getting very wet out there in the rain. Next, please. And this is where a contraceptive initiative can have the greatest impact. So Family Planning Elevated acts as a payer for these folks, allowing them to receive no-cost contraception. And while we're focusing on contraceptive care within that gap, we're also working to uh, optimize contraceptive care for people with insurance. Um, so next, please. 
Great. And here you can see the, <clears throat> the folks for whom family planning elevated is covering. Um, and one more click. Yeah. So we know that insurance coverage doesn't guarantee that the local health center has your preferred IUD in stock or that a provider is trained to place it or remove it. And we're working with these clinics to make the theoretical coverage of insurance across the spectrum actual coverage. Next. All right. Okay, so I also want to take a look at um, the, the methods that are covered here um, in Family Planning Elevated. And while we are going to focus um, in, in the next couple of slides on um, our work to expand access to IUDs and, and copper IUD, I think it's really important that we're also, um, that I, I mentioned at this point, that this is an initiative that um, is about contraceptive, uh, comprehensive contraceptive access. Each of the methods that's represented on the screen. Um, now, I came to this program having worked for the past eight years uh, on IUD specific programs, both in the US and abroad. And the rationale for focusing on IUDs in those programs was that IUDs are underrepresented in the method mix and that more people uh, would want them and use them if only we could overcome <clears throat> the many barriers that exist. Um, barriers that uh, Tessa mentioned earlier in this presentation, um, affordability, lack of provider training and confidence, uh, misconceptions among both clinicians and clients and clinic workflow issues. Um, <clears throat> fast forward to 2018 and I found myself here in Utah and my colleagues had just discovered during our county level initiative that when costs were removed, Yes, clients were twice as likely to choose an IUD or implant compared to when there were out-of-pocket costs. Um, but also nearly half of clients uh, still chose pills, patches, rings, and shots. Uh, Utahns want their full menu of options and my job through FPE has been to make sure that they have it. Um, so at times it's IUDs that need our dedicated effort. Other times it's the patch or fertility awareness-based methods that need some extra championing. Um, and it, it reminds me of a moment just when we were rolling out Family Planning Elevated and I spent a very fraught hour calculating the cost of stocking cervical caps in every Family Planning Elevated clinic. Um, and not just one, but the three sizes that exist <clears throat> for each clinic. And I was poring over those numbers and had to ask myself, would I be sweating the cost like this if it were IUDs? Um, and we talk a lot about provider bias affecting client choice um, and less so about structural bias within programs. And so the litmus test that we use for IUDs should be the same for all methods. Would more people naturally want this method if we increase provider, um, provider knowledge and skills and removed other access barriers? And if so, then we have to tear a page from that IUD playbook and do something about it. Um, it sounds like an oxymoron, but remaining passionately neutral <clears throat> about this work and helping all methods overcome those access barriers is one of the most essential inputs to a program um, that offers LARC and one of the things that I am most proud that FPE has committed to doing. Next, please. All right. So. Um, so how does family planning elevated work? Um, this is a very simplified version of our logic model, and I would love to dive into each of these four facets, <clears throat> facets of the program, from our work with patients, um, to our work with the community, through the, our Reproductive Justice Community Advisory Board, um, and our work with policymakers. But today I'm just going to focus on the support we provide to health centers specifically to expand IUD access. Next, please. Great. So uh, first, a cash grant. We provide a cash grant of up to $100,000 for family planning elevated organizations to purchase equipment and supplies for contraceptive care. These are things like exam tables, autoclaves, tenaculum, speculums, um, and sites can also use this cash grant to hire personnel or increase provider hours over the course of their two-year participation in the program. Um, next, method stocking. So in order for clinics to provide same day, no cost contraception to eligible clients, we stock clinics directly with IUDs, both copper and hormonal IUDs, as well as implants and barrier methods. 
Uh, we aren't able to stock prescription hormonal methods like pill patch, brain depo, and EC, but we do fully reimburse clinics for them. Um, patients can try any methods they like during the Family Planning Elevated program, and switching and exploring new options is highly encouraged. Service reimbursement, um, again, to make contraception free of cost for the client, we reimburse clinics for providing contraceptive services. For IUDs, that includes contraceptive counseling, IUD placement, removal, and STI screening in the context of IUD placement. Um, and then we reimburse for these services at the current Medicaid rate. And training and evaluation are big enough activities that they warranted their own slides. Uh, so next, please. All right, so let's talk about IUD training. Um, and again, <clears throat> just a reminder that this is just one of the training areas we provide in addition to training on person-centered contraceptive counseling and other methods. When we launched Family Planning Elevated back in 2019, we started with a, our first cohort of just three clinics. And our strategy at the time was, let's just bring them all together for a big training conference um, and uh, for the clinics and the larger community. And that's what we did. We trained 25 providers on IUDs, both hormonal and non-hormonal, through a hands-on practicum and an Ask the Experts panel. And you can see in that picture there, somebody playing around with one of those fantastic Vertimed simulators. Um, <clears throat> and then we followed up with individual proctoring for those newly trained providers within their clinic. Our clinical training specialists made many, many, <clears throat> many trips to observe placement and removal um, of each of the devices. Over the following year, as more clinics joined the program, we pivoted away from that conference model. It turns out it's just really, really hard to get providers out of clinic um, and to a, a conference on one day and shifted towards more individualized trainings. And we continued proctoring at sites um, with providers who were new to IUD. Oftentimes those trainings involve the whole care team. Next. And here you can see this is a, a provider at a rural um, county health department uh, with her whole care team helping her learn IUD placement. And since the start of Family Planning Elevated, we've trained nearly 100 providers on IUD services. Um, after training, our clinical, uh, um, our clinical training specialist also provides expert consultation to sites on complex cases and removals. Next, please. In addition to the clinical IUD skills, we also provide a training that looks not just at the insertion and removal of an IUD, but considers the broader clinic environment in which a method such as an IUD is provided. Um, so we get at what are the sticking points for getting a client an IUD or a removal? Um, during a simulation training, we run through simula simulated patient scenarios crafted to highlight clinic workflow. Um, our patient actress starts at the front desk, as you can see here in this photo. Next, proceeds through uh, MA rooming and screening. Next, to counseling. Next, and ultimately provision of a family planning method or service. Um, and that could be a barrier method, a short acting method. Um, we also use a task trainer to allow for placement um, or removal of an IUD. Um, so this has been a really valuable diagnostic tool for us to actually see what contraceptive care looks like and support our clinics in delivering quality care moving forward. Um, we get to see, you know, is the, is the preferred IUD in stock? Does the medical assistant set up the uh, instrument tray correctly? What patient education materials are used? Do we see non-directive, culturally appropriate person-centered counseling? Um, are providers discouraging IUD removal? Uh, where are the gaps and, and how can we help address them? Anecdotally, this has been one of the biggest game changers for our program doing these simulation trainings. And we're currently undertaking an evaluation of our simulation program to measure its utility as a programmatic tool. Next, please. So how has participation in Family Planning Elevated, including all of that training and support, um, impacted IUD services at, the, at these sites. Um, next. I thought it would be helpful to look at our first cohort of clinics in Family Planning Elevated since we have the most, uh, the, the longest um, amount of, most amount of data from them. Um, and most importantly, sufficient pre-pandemic data to show, um, to show trends. Next, please. So what you see here is a shift in proportion of IUD services both before and after FP started with that dotted line showing when FP was initiated. 
Um, and Clinic One, which you can see here, um, is a private rural clinic uh, with a motivated trained provider. And we see high IUD provision prior to FPE. Um, we provided limited refresher training and proctoring for one of their part-time providers. And, and you can see over time just a slight increase, but mostly a, high, a sustained high rate of IUD services. Next. Clinic Two um, is a moderate IUD provision site. Most, but not all, providers had been trained on IUDs before family planning elevated, so we provided training for those providers who needed it. Um, and here, again, we see some steady increases in IUD services post-FPE. Next. And Clinic 3, um, pre-family planning elevated, was a low IUD provision site. Um, Providers had attended one tra training event of ours prior to starting the program, but were generally not offering IUD services. Um, and after initial training, followed by numerous proctoring sessions for each provider, we saw uh, significant increases in their IUD services. So these print, um, oh, so just back one sec. Yeah, so these pre-pandemic trends show all sites increased provision of IUD services, but the more dramatic increases were at sites where additional service delivery support was, was needed and provided. Um, <clears throat> now, we are not looking at patient level data through Family Planning Elevated, so we can't track method switching behaviors, but um, overall trends show a decrease in depot services, so it's reasonable to think that's where um, some of these IUD gains are coming from. And I should say here, this is not mind blowing what we're seeing. Um, it's the dose response effect we would expect. And yet I think it also highlights the significant, significant amount of training hours, demo kits, and um, definitely breakfast pastries that are needed to support IUD skills. Um, in the two years we've been doing this, we haven't yet discovered any shortcuts, any silver bullets to uh, more efficiently scale up provider training. It takes what it takes for a provider to gain competency and for a clinic to gain competency. Um, but we are excited to explore in our final year shifting to a train the trainer approach to develop the skills of proctors within each of these FPE clinic systems. In all, nearly 20,000 contraceptive services have been provided by FPE CAP clinics since the intervention started. Nearly 8,000 clients have received no cost contraception and over 1,000 IUD services have been provided free of cost at FPE CAP clinics. That's thousands of Utahns who have hopefully found a contraceptive method that works for them. Next, please. Um, I mentioned earlier that the simulation training has been a great programmatic tool for us to peek into the health of the program. Um, and I also want to mention that we have a robust monitoring and evaluation plan um, utilizing a number of data sources, which you can see here. Um, we, we use the <clears throat> electronic medical records from clinics um, to measure our primary outcome. Um, basically, did, did um, FPE cap increase provision of contraceptive services to individuals under 250% federal poverty level compared with our control clinics um, that, that did not receive the intervention. We're also assessing the impact of our trainings with longitudinal provider surveys. We're collecting client exit surveys, um, uh, which are administered after any contraceptive visit at an FPE cap clinic um, to look at uh, quality scores for providers and clinic staff and help us determine if clients receive respectful person-centered contraceptive care and get the method of their choice. Um, we also have pretty robust uh, process evaluation and monitoring indicators, um, again, kind of peeking into what's happening. Um, you know, is, is the percentage of LARC services higher than the established demand or prevalence that we would expect? Um, did the clinic provide uh, at least a few low demand methods to clients during the past six months um, and those sorts of indicators? Um, lastly, we are also evaluating access measures through statewide surveillance data, um, like the BRFSS, um, and getting at questions for clients about, are you using the method you want? How did you pay for it? Um, overall, we are not focusing on reducing unintended birth rates, um, but we're focused on increasing access to comprehensive contra contraceptive care provided in a person-centered way without economic or geographic barriers. Next, please. And this was my ambitious thought that we would have time to talk about what's next for FPE, um, but it is time uh, to turn the presentation over. And, and I, a hearty thanks to our partners um, involved in the, the work on the front lines delivering contraceptive care, as well as the donors who have supported our program. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Caitlin, and thanks to Anita as well as uh, Tessa for <clears throat> the excellent presentation. I know that we are uh, uh, running a little bit uh, uh, behind schedule, but I still like to spend like one to two minutes and, and uh, opt not to use our bio break to just deal with some of the uh, 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 questions, a wealth of questions uh, coming in for postpartum uh, IUD. So I wonder if, if uh, um, <clears throat> Anita could uh, just jump in and, and respond to some of the questions, for example, like related to uh, the missing strings, and the, how was that evaluated, uh, remove access to removal services, particularly for PPIUD, uh, the uh, implications for introducing LNG, uh, as well as probably one question relevant to our colleagues who's working out of Kenya around uh, 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 addressing needs of, of access to services in rural uh, uh, low resource setting, if there's any experience or insights coming from the PPIUD project. I know one to two minutes may not be sufficient to cover all of those, but I leave it to Anita to uh, uh, prioritize which ones that she could answer. Fine, yeah, I'll do my best. Um, so um, in terms of missing threads, yeah, so I, uh, I don't know, Ricky, whether will the participants have access to that list of publications that I sent to, to yourself? Yes, so, so An Anita has, has uh, and Figo has generally, generally, generously uh, 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 provide permission uh, to uh, uh, access uh, all of the publications related to the project, and we will be making those uh, uh, available, the links available on the yeah. web page once the recording of this presentation is uh, uh, online. Yeah, so so just to because there is a there was a supplement published in 2018 which looked at pooled our results across the six countries and so it gives you figures for things like for example missing threads. But it wasn't high, it was less than 1% for missing threads. In terms of access to removal services, so because uh, this the initiative was only took place in in um, countries and, and in facilities that would normally be inserting interval IUDs, then the removal service was the same. So we only provided it in areas where, where IUD interval IUD was common practice, in which case PPIUD women would slot into the same follow-up system and so they could go to the family planning clinics locally and, and have a removal when, when they wanted. Um, there was a question about the cost effectiveness study. Um, so just to say that, yes, um, it did include the cost of maintaining the services over time in, in, in terms of uh, retraining and, and um, quality improvement, etc. cetera. Um, it didn't include, include the costs of, you know, the salaries of the people involved because they would be, it would just be an additional task to their normal jobs, you know, people on delivery suite or on delivery suite, whether they're inserting a PPIUD or not. So just to make that clear. Um, so I've answered the missing thread. I'm there just is one on LNG, the implication of, in, uh, with, with the availability of LNG in low and middle income, so selected low yeah. and middle income countries. So just to contextualize it. So, I mean, this started in 2013 and then really was properly ongoing in the five countries in 2015. And um, there wasn't, uh, you know, the we didn't buy any of the commodities. So we only, we wanted, we, I mean, one of the preconditions for working in the countries was that the commodities were provided by the governments through their universal health coverage system. So there were no costs attached to it. And we wouldn't, weren't, weren't buying the commodities for, for the country. So, um, you know, uh, leave a gestural IUS isn't really, um, isn't an option in any of those countries or wasn't an option in any of those countries. The implant came in sort of during that period of time. So towards the end of the project. So 20, uh, 18 and 19 implants are available in some of the facilities in some of the countries, but our counseling was about all methods. Um, and the implant uh, availability was very much sort of single projects making them available. So it wasn't like a national program. So it still wasn't supplied through the government free of charge. It was it was sort of international NGOs. Does that answer everyone's questions, I think? There is one related uh, of immediate <coughs> of a, a, a question regarding removal services and how to access it. 
Yeah, so, so, uh, so I thought I'd mention that. So in terms of removal services, because the, uh, we were working in areas where interval IUDs were commonly used, I mean, commonly is not a really, it wasn't, uh, you know, a very popular method, I think sort of two, three percent, but the IUD removal services were the same. So then the women who had PPIUD would slot into the normal follow up that they would have in a family planning clinic had they had an interval IUD inserted. So it was no different for removal. Um, the issue with lost threads. So about a third of the ladies, the thread wasn't visible when they came at six uh, weeks postpartum. Um, and then I have some anecdotal evidence that about a year later, once they started menstruating, that that reduced by another half. So 15% of women had an issue with lost threads. And we did uh, teach them to use uh, or part of the training included uh, thread retrieval, um, the little thread retrieval, um, what do you call it, tube, and um, also otherwise using the cyter brush that's, you know, used for, for doing smears to help bring the threads down. Um, and also obviously a need for ultras access to ultrasound to ensure that actually the, the IUD hadn't been expelled in those 15 cases where 15 percent of cases where they couldn't feel the threads at, at speculum or the mother couldn't feel it or the or at speculum it wasn't visible. Well thank you so much uh, Anita and I know that there are a couple more questions that have been left unanswered so I've requested our uh, resource speakers to respond to them directly on uh, uh, the chat or, and, and then uh, uh, we'll be, if we don't have a chance to respond to that in the chat box, you will uh, uh, follow up and, and post the responses to those questions online. So I'd like, given that we're uh, uh, omitting the bio break given time, is I'd like to quickly just uh, uh, turn around and, and ask uh, our colleague, Kate Rademacher, who's managing the, uh, the mini session to uh, uh, start her uh, uh, round table discussion. On to you, Kate. Great, thanks so much, Ricky. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Ricky, and thanks to the uh, first group of panelists and speakers. That was fabulous. Um, my name, again, is Kate Rademacher. I'm a senior technical advisor at FHI 360, and I oversee our portfolio of activities that's uh, USAID and Gates funded, uh, looking at how we might expand access to the hormonal IUS globally. Uh, and so it's really exciting to be part of this event. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, from the event organizers and we have a lot we have a great panel and we have a lot of people on the line who have been involved in this global initiative so um, this has truly been a community of practice and a lot of effort uh, on the part of many people so exciting to share some updates today next slide please so just a brief overview, we have a panel within this part of the session. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview and then colleagues from USAID, FCDO, Population Council and Japaigo Kenya are going to make presentations. I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves as we move to each presentation. Next slide. So um, as some of you may know, uh, the levonorgestrel releasing IUS, also known as the hormonal IUS, uh, was first introduced in Finland in 1990 and in the United States into the year 2000. Um, what you may not know if you work domestically in the United States is that the method is essentially not available at scale in any of uh, the what we call the FP2020 countries, which are 69 of the lowest resource setting countries that are focused on an international um, efforts to expand access to family planning. And so the method was added to the World Health Organization's essential medicine list in 2015, but yet we're still not seeing wide, widespread uh, scale up. The method is available in some countries in limited settings, but we're at a really exciting, I think, tipping point, and that's what you're going to be hearing more, more about today. Uh, we're working together as a global community to change that and to expand access. So I think this is just a perfect moment in time to be reflecting and to be sharing updates uh, and look forward to doing that as we move forward. Next slide. So just a bit of a more about the history here. Um, it has been a winding road to expanding access. And as I just mentioned, you can just follow along with the milestones with me. The, the method was first developed in the 1970s through the leadership of the Population Council. Um, Jim Saylor is gonna talk with us a little bit more about the work of the ICA Foundation, uh, which was launched in 2003. You can see the, the third um, milestone on the chart there and the International Contraceptive Access Foundation is a public private partnership between population and bear to expand access to donated units and so they've donated uh, I think Jim you can confirm it a little over 150,000 units um, since the inception of the foundation. 
Fast forward to 2015, many of you know that um, Liletta was approved by the FDA, which is um, let, distributed by Medicines 360 and their partners. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide, but Liletta is distributed with the brand named Avibella in low and middle income countries. Um, I also mentioned that in 2015, the method was first added to WHO's essential medicine list. So if you swoop around to the left and then the uh, milestone, um, I think because of a lot of the changes we saw in 2015, many of us in the international community got excited about the potential for expanded access. Um, we with the leadership of USAID, which Tabitha is going to talk a little bit about more, we launched a global working group and developed a global learning agenda. Out of that, using a lot of the donations from the ICA Foundation, we were able to, as a community practice, uh, launch pilots in a number of countries, including Kenya, Nigeria, Madagascar, and Zambia, and um, conducted research there, showing which showed high acceptability and potential demand for the method. Avibella, as I mentioned, is the um, trade name for Liletta that's used in low and middle income countries and the, and the method was registered in the countries listed above. And subsequently, the ministries of health expressed interest in scaling up the method. In 2020, we uh, restructured the working group that I mentioned previously, and it's now called the Hormonal IUS Access Group. Um, FCDO, formerly DFID, really um, has come in and playing a lot, strong leadership role in that effort, along with USAID and other donors. Again, you'll hear more about that from Tabitha and Anna in the next presentation. Um, what's really, really exciting is that USAID and UNFPA, which are the two biggest procurers of family planning in low and middle income countries, are in the process of adding the method to their product product catalogs for the first time ever, um, and we're expecting that to happen in Q1 of this year. Next slide, please. So just briefly, um, some of you, again, are, are quite familiar with the products that are available in the United States. I just want to mention that in order for a product to be eligible for procurement by USAID or UNFPA, it has to be approved by a stringent regulatory authority, like the FDA or the EMA, or it has to be WHO pre-qualified. So these are the three products that meet those criteria currently, Bears Morena, the ICA Foundation's unbranded LNGIUS, and Medicines 360's Avibella product. There are additional hormonal IUS products that are being distributed and used in LMICs, including Pregna's Aloira product. I think colleagues from Pregna are on the line, so we can also um, potentially take questions about that. Next slide. So as I mentioned, one of the things we did in 2015 is came, we came together to develop a global learning agenda. Um, we published that in the um, Global Health Science and Practice Journal, so you can check it out. And we really tried as a community of practice to align on what questions do we need to answer in low and middle income countries about this method. Um, and so we've made progress towards uh, gathering data and you're gonna be hearing from our colleague, Susan, about one of the um, efforts in Kenya that has been ongoing. Next slide. So this is a study, uh, excuse me, an overview of research, research studies that have been conducted. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the um, knowledge sharing portal we've just recently launched where you can learn more about these studies. And again, um, Susan from, uh, from Kenya is going to talk about Japago's work there. So we'll be hearing more about that in a minute. Next slide. Great. So I'm now going to hand it over to Tabitha and Anna to introduce yourselves and to tell us a little bit more about the Hormonal IUS Access Group and the work that's being done globally. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, so I'll start and then hand it over to Anna. So hi, my name is uh, Tabitha Sripipatana. So I'm the Deputy Division Chief of um, Research in USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. And I manage two projects that are coordinating um, introduction strategies for the hormonal IUS and my colleague. Hi everyone, it's lovely to be here today. I'm Anna Hazelwood and I'm a program manager working in the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, and I sit in our reproductive health commodities team and we manage a number of commodity investments um, which seek to expand access to new and lesser used products, um, including the hormonal IUS. Great. So Anne and I are going to present an overview of the global stakeholder coordination uh, framework that uh, Kate introduced. It's called the Hormonal IOS Access Group. Next slide, please. So again, in 2015, there was, um, of course, a new stringent regulatory approved product that was approaching a price point 
that was feasible for low and middle income country introduction. Um, and so um, there was a convening of a global working group that was established to evaluate this potential to expand access of the hormonal IUS and, and, and an opportunity for us to coordinate a shared learning agenda and pilot activities across multiple partners. And so building upon the leadership of that group and at the country level, a global consortium comprised of donors, including Gates, um, FCDO aid and um, includes UNFPA as well. Governments and partner organizations begin um, exploring concrete opportunities to sustainably increase access to the hormonal IOS beyond the pilot uh, introduction efforts. So the work to sustainably increase access to the hormonal IOS involves parallel efforts to ensure supply, um, support demand, and continue to implement a learning agenda that's being revised. So in 2020, this consortium evolved into this newly formed hormonal IOS access group and began planning for the execution of a strategy aimed at facilitating broader access. So the approach used a focused end phase strategy for broader introduction and scale up of hormonal IOS. Next slide, please. So um, the access group was convened to, to connect work across the supply and demand side of the markets. For example, on the demand side, effectively increasing access um, will require the implementation of this phased product introduction approach with a high degree of coordination across countries as we match up scale up and training and other introduction activities with available supply and to ensure countries that choose to introduce this method are really prepared to do so efficiently. On the supply side, um, as Kate mentioned, UNFPA and us at aid are in the process of adding hormonal IOS to their product catalogs for procurement. So supply of the method is still expected to be available for donor uh, procurement for the public sector in low and uh, middle income countries in early 2020, hopefully in the next couple of months. So of course, product of affordability is key, but if, uh, it's not everything. Once achieved, targeted donor funding will be available um, and, and through a few mechanisms to support public sector product introduction efforts. And FCDO has set aside additional earmarked funding for countries to procure the hormonal IS through the UNFP supply mechanism. So I'll hand this over to Anna to describe what the group looks like now. Next slide. Thank you, Tabitha. Um, so yeah, as Tabitha said, to expand access to this method, we have um, evolved our structure um, and organised ourselves into what we're now calling the Hormonal IUS Access Group. Um, and this, as you can see on the slide, um, consists of a steering committee and also a partners group. Um, and so the steering committee is essentially a decision making group. Um, made up of various donors, procurers, and technical partners. Um, so this includes uh, FCDO, or UK, um, USAID, UNFPA, Gates, um, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, FHI 360, and PSM. Um, and essentially, the steering committee is responsible for monitoring the implementation of our phased and focused access strategy. Um, which Tabitha mentioned and which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Um, and so this includes various activities, um, including monitoring market health, uh, reviewing demand forecasts, um, maintaining strong relationships with our suppliers, um, and also communicating more broadly with the wider family planning community. So that's the steering committee. Um, and we also have this partners group as well, which I mentioned, um, and this essentially consists of various NGO partners, um, procurers and some country government representatives. Um, and this essentially functions as a technical working group um, that supports the implementation of countries product introduction strategies um, and also works to share lessons um, across programs and countries and also to provide information to the steering committee to support overall decision making. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, together, this access group is overseeing the implementation of a fo uh, focused and phased uh, strategy for broader introduction and scale up of the hormonal IUS, um, which is really exciting. 
So essentially at the heart of this strategy is the key consideration that we need to make sure that we don't create an early demand for the product um, that could outstrip supply. And so this means that our plan is to make the method available in phases um, to an increasing number of countries over time. So in the near term, um, the plan is to begin by introducing the, the product in the public sector um, very opportunistically. So this means that we will begin by working with countries where there's already the necessary uh, technical assistance and investments lined up um, to support product introduction through the public sector. Um, and then building on this initial success will then look to support um, more of a total market approach in the medium term um, once we know that there's sufficient product um, to support availability through the private sector. So as part of this phased approach, um, we are starting to work um, initially with countries that are currently planning to introduce the hormonal IUS as part of their method mix. Um, and so these are, these are countries that have indicated um, strong government interest in adding the product to their method mix, um, where the vision for introduction wouldn't undermine the supply that we have available. Um, also countries where a product is already registered or the registration is underway, um, where there's already provider readiness um, and where countries have already started to develop plans for availability through the public sector. Um, so just to give you a, a flavor of the countries that are included within this first phase, um, this is currently including Kenya, Nigeria, Madagascar, Zambia and Rwanda. Um, but just to say that in parallel um, to this work that we're doing with our phase one countries, we're also really encouraging governments and countries that are interested in expanding access to the product in the future to get in touch with us um, via this email address for the IUS access portal, which you can see on the screen. Um, and really, once a country does express interest, um, we'll look to work with uh, governments and partners um, to align on scope and timelines. Next slide, please. Um, so, as I say, we've included this email address here, which is for the IUS access portal, um, and would really just encourage anyone who's considering or planning IUS introduction, um, or would just like to receive any more information or has questions for the hormonal IUS access group, um, to reach out via this email address, um, and someone from the group will get back to you. So thanks very much. Um, I'll hand it back over to Kate now. Great. Thank you so much, Anna and Tabitha. That was a great overview. I'm now going to hand it to Jim Saylor from the Population Council uh, to tell us a little bit more about the ICA Foundation. Jim, do you mind um, introducing yourself and um, sharing your updates with us? Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. My name is Jim Saylor, and I am the uh, Executive Director at the Population Council Center for Biomedical Research. I have another hat for this uh, for this event, which is I am the chairman of the board of the International Contraceptive Access Foundation. And so I'm really delighted uh, to talk a little bit about the ICA Foundation. Uh, the POP Council hat is relevant because the POP Council was the uh, inventor and developer of both the original LNG IUS, uh, which you can see pictured here, um, a brand name Morena uh, uh, also, and, uh, and the Copper T IUD. And it's a pleasure to see so many terrific people here, including uh, some of my very important predecessors like uh, Irv Sivan, uh, who had an incredible role uh, in the development of uh, IUDs uh, and implants uh, while at the Population Council. Uh, the next slide, uh, please. Uh, so the, uh, Kate mentioned it earlier. Uh, this was a partnership between the Population Council which developed Mirena and Bayer, uh, which distributes now Mirena and LNG IUS. It was established in, 19, in 2003 and uh, incorporated in 2004. It's a Finnish foundation, uh, the ICA foundation, because as people may know, that is where uh, Mirena and the LNG IUS are both, uh, are both uh, produced. That's where they're manufactured. Uh, and uh, you can see how long we've been, we've been working, uh, and you'll, you'll hear a little bit about it momentarily. We like to think, we're hoping that we have helped to pave the way for some of the uh, access work that's being done now. And I'll show you a little bit about that if we can move on to the next slide. So we, so far, uh, Kate was right, we've uh, delivered 164,455 LNG IUS for the most updated number. 
uh, to entities in 37 uh, countries around the world. And we work on a response model, which is when someone asks us uh, for uh, LNG IUS, makes a proposal, we, we will consider that. And we consider most uh, LMICs uh, as potential sites. Uh, next slide. We have a board of uh, trustees. Uh, as you can see, I'm the uh, chair. The vice chair is from Bayer, Frank Stralo. You can see our host today, Ricky Liu, is on the board. My colleague, Samia Ramarao, uh, Dr. Westhoff, uh, who is uh, on the organizing committee uh, for, this, uh, for this symposium as well. And then we have representatives from many other groups. Next slide. Uh, this is just a quick map of active projects. The earlier map I showed you was all the projects. Uh, here are some of the active projects um, uh, that we have, uh, Central and South America, Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Asia. Next slide. Uh, here are some of the networks. This is an update from a recent board presentation where the insertions are the number that the, each of these network organizations reported during the previous uh, during the previous six months. Uh, and the reason I wanted to show you this was to show that, uh, that we do work with a lot of the important organizations also on this panel uh, that you've seen, IPPF, uh, JPIGO, uh, and some uh, MSI, and some non-traditional ones as well. Uh, you probably uh, don't see AmeriCares a lot uh, in, um, uh, in this world, but uh, we, we, they do have uh, uh, two projects uh, as well with us. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is our donations per year. You can see we started off very modestly. We increased, uh, we have a decrease in 2020. Part of, part of that, I'm not sure we have all the reports from the end of the year. And there's uh, some COVID related uh, issues for that as well. Uh, but our um, number of projects and the, and the number per project have been going up, uh, uh, up and down, but mostly up uh, over the last, uh, especially uh, five or six years. Next slide. This is the one that I want to kind of focus on the most. It's what have we learned? Uh, Caitlin referred to this before. I thought it was an excellent point in her program, uh, the critical, criticality of champions on the ground. Uh, and they can be uh, uh, very different kinds of people. Uh, one of our champions is on this call, Dr. Baja Mondes from Brazil, uh, who uh, is the sponsor for our largest pro uh, project. And you might expect uh, someone, an eminent researcher and clinician like Dr. Baja Mondes to be a, a, an effective champion, and he really is. We also have Rotary uh, in Nigeria is one of our uh, other very large projects. And, and that is uh, uh, headed and championed by a, uh, uh, an octogenarian Rotarian from Germany uh, who uh, really believes in this method and is passionate about it. The champions can come uh, from lots of different places. The second point I wanted to make is that the network effect uh, is real and significant. Anna mentioned before five countries uh, where they're rolling up. Uh, in three of those countries, we have multiple projects within the same country, um, uh, Zambia, uh, Kenya, and Nigeria. And they have formed communities of practice and are supporting one another in a variety of ways. That's a big deal. Uh, that's a big deal, too. The third one is that a variety of models can work. Uh, and uh, I've mentioned that a little bit already, AmeriCares, which is a very different kind of organization, along with the more traditional organizations like JPIGO and IPPF and MSI uh, and, uh, and the university system uh, that Dr. Baja Mondes works in. Uh, the fourth one is about regulatory approach, and that really matters. Uh, uh, these products were uh, uh, approved and there's a regulatory strategy before uh, really uh, moving them, uh, moving it uh, into the uh, lower and middle income companies, countries of having uh, US regulatory approval. Uh, that really, really matters. Uh, then European, of course, and, and so on. Uh, but people sometimes ask us at the Population Council, why are you registering your products in the, with the US FDA first? It really helps pave the way uh, for access on the ground later. And the last one is just the importance of strategy. Uh, and, uh, we have uh, kept to a strategy and constantly refined our strategy over, over time. And it's been something that uh, we uh, uh, are, are constantly reevaluating. Re but we know what we can do and we can't do. And we really try to uh, uh, focus on what we're able to do. And, and the record has been, uh, I think, uh, uh, pretty positive over the years. Thank you so much. That's it from me. 
Great. Thanks, Jim. And a huge thanks to the ICA Foundation for um, the catalytic work that you've done in many countries to uh, provide early experience, as you have described. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Susan, from Chapayo, Kenya. Before I do that, I just want to answer one question that's come up in the chat um, that Carolyn Westhoff posed. And so I should have clarified this at the beginning. In most of the countries that are almost, I think all of the countries we're talking about, the copper IUD is available and has been part of the contraceptive method mix uh, for quite some time. Um, also, implants are typically available in these countries. It's really the levonorgestrel releasing IUS, which has been missing from the public sector, which is why we're focusing on it today. So again, uh, to say that we uh, were, were uh, as a community of practice, really focused on advancing a full, um, the LNGS is part of a full and comprehensive method mix. Um, and so actually, Susan's going to be talking a little bit about the method mix in Kenya. So that's a good segue as well. Susan, are you, um, are you there? Yes, thank you, Kate. Uh, my name is Susan Ontiri. I'm a public health professional currently working with Japaigo in Kenya as the deputy project director for the USID funded Afia Halisi project, which is a reproductive maternal newborn adolescent and health project. And I also lead the MD component within the project organization. Next slide. So to understand uh, the progress that Kenya has made, uh, I have this graph to show the tremendous increase in contraceptive prevalence rate that we've observed over the last four decades. It has been a gradual increase right from 7% in the 70s all the way to 20, 2018, where we actually had a modern contraceptive prevalence rate of 61%, thus even surpassing the national target of 58%. But in 2019, we saw a slight decline. But overall, Kenya is actually, when you, put, when you plot this within the S-curve, Kenya is actually lies within the plateau stage of the S-curve. Thus, the focus right now is addressing equity issues. In as much as we are seeing this tremendous improvement, we still have regions that have a contraceptive prevalence rate of as low as even 2%, while others have up to three, up to 70 to 80%. Hence, addressing quality of care issues, commodity availability is one of the core priority areas within our country. Next slide. This slide shows uh, the modern contraceptive method mix among married users uh, using uh, national surveys, particularly the demographic health survey and the PMA data. As you can see, uh, over the last uh, 10 years, we've seen a shift towards uh, LAC methods, particularly implants. But when you look at IUD, the method has more or less stagnated between four to eight percent. In two or three, the method share within the method mix was eight percent. And recent data in 2019, we've actually seen it has uh, slightly gone down to four percent. While uh, injectables that used to be popular and even pills have now uh, reduced, and one could as well argue that um, implants have increased the share of the method mix. Next. So uh, we introduced the LNG uh, IUS in uh, late 2016, early 2017. This was as a result of a collaboration between the USAID's Global Maternal Child and Survival Program and uh, through, again, donations offered by ICA Foundation. Of course, uh, led by the Kenya Ministry of Health because we wanted them to be you know, in the driving seat for sustainability. And also, we decided to introduce this method in two counties, Kisumu and Migori, where uh, MCSP project uh, was being implemented in Kenya. This method was available in the public health facilities. At this point, I must mention that uh, we've had uh, products such as Mirena over the past several decades, but they've only been confined in the private facilities because they are quite expensive, retailing between $100 to $150. Hence, they are not easily accessible to the vast majority of the Kenyan women. Next. So how the introduction process happened was uh, after ICA Foundation availed the commodity, we held advocacy meetings at national level. Luckily, Kenya has had a positive family planning environment. The political goodwill has always been there. We did joint planning at national level. And one of the things we realized because this method was not widely available, we had to adapt the global learning resource package that had been developed at global level so that we have our context-specific uh, 
content. The other aspect was uh, the routine data collection tools that are found within the HMI system did not capture hormonal IUS, again, because of its unavailability. So we developed and we customized the existing national tools to have a section where we could disaggregate the IUD into non-hormonal, that is the copper IUD, which was born, which is currently available widespread, and also the non-hormonal IUD. We also introduced some supplemental tools that were able to support tracking our commodity, the commodity aspect, so that we were able to actually follow up on the commodities that had been received and ensure reporting. The next thing was to build a team of mentors who would uh, cascade the trainings. We selected a number of family planning mentors, both at national level and in the two count counties, and they were trained using the revised learning resource package. And these mentors had already, were already proficient in providing family planning services, but just uh, the additional component of hormonal IUS is what they undertook. Uh, at that point, we didn't have a massive community sensitization platform, but we decided to conduct within the health facilities to have health education and sensitization forum, where providers will actually inform women availability of this additional method, so that uh, they use that as a word out there. And uh, interesting to find is that um, later on, we started seeing women coming to the facility saying they've been informed by their by their peers or friends that there is availability of this method within the facility. The other aspect that we did later on was to have a study initiation as part of implementation science because we wanted to understand uh, the level of satisfaction with this method, the level of, uh, you know, the type of clients who will actually take up and whether we'll see a reduction in the uh, copper IUD to also build on, on other researches that have been done by FHI and uh, MSI. We did also on-site structured mentorship using the mentors that had been trained and uh, service delivery components, ensuring supportive supervision, ensuring that uh, tools were correctly filled up and availability of all commodities in those facilities to ensure that women were getting the full range of commodities to enable them to make informed trades. Later on, we, uh, based on the success that we had observed in this uh, intervention facilities, which were 42 at the onset, we were able to scale up this uh, process beyond the 42 facilities to up to 70 facilities in the two counties and also an additional county when the Maternal Child and Survival Project came to an end and uh, the USID bilateral project of Halisi came on board, we were able to scale it up to a third county, which is a neighboring county called Kakamega. And right now what is happening is we are monitoring implementation. We've been able to actually get the counties interested in this. Right now they're the ones who are doing the county distribution and also tracking the availability of these commodities across. Next slide. So in terms of numbers, what we've been able to achieve uh, having this method in 70 public health facilities, having a team of 48 qualified mentors who supported in conducting 37 training and over 300 service providers have actually been reached with this um, training. And so far as of December last year, we had over 2,500 clients accessing this method. Next slide. So when you look at some of the preliminary results of the characteristic of the LNG IUS adapter, we see that the average age was around 28 uh, years. Almost over 80% of them were married with 16% uh, of them having uh, more than five children. Of interesting to note was that 70% of these clients who took up this method were either not using any form of contraception or were switching from a short acting method to a long acting method. Meaning that this hormonal method is able to expand access and also increase our uh, continuation since we well know even from the presentations that have been earlier made, lack methods have a better continuation rate compared to short-term method. And also the fact that we were able to get 59% of these clients taking up this method and they were actually less than one year postpartum. Next. On client satisfaction, nine out of 10 of the women uh, who are interviewed were satisfied with their decision to take up this method. And they even mentioned that they would recommend it to other women, something that we saw it later from what I've mentioned earlier, women coming to the facility asking uh, for this additional method based on what they had heard from their peers. 
Uh, next slide. So in terms of what is happening uh, currently, we've uh, developed a Kenya IUS community of practice that is drawn from uh, several implementing partners, both at Kenya and also at global level. And we try to meet on a quarterly basis to discuss the progress. There is also, uh, we've also done continued uh, coordination in engaging, especially with the Ministry of Health to ensure that uh, IUS is included in a national scale as part of the method mix. For instance, the Clinton Health Access Initiative through funding from FCDO, they are currently supporting uh, the Ministry of Health to come up with product uh, mechanisms for introduction. And LNG IUS is one of the products that will be tried using this new mechanism. And then the other aspect that we've been able to see that was before COVID early last year was uh, based on the huge success we saw in the two counties, we've had other counties coming over to actually do an uh, inter-county visit under um, the Ministry of Health leadership. And uh, of interest to note is the fact that they want to actually introduce this method and currently there are discussions. We were able to also support dissemination of the FP guidelines because now the FP guidelines have uh, included hormonal IUS. And right now these guidelines are widely available in different parts of the country. The other thing to note was uh, this entire process happened at the point in time when Kenya was revising its health management information system. And we were able to advocate for inclusion of hormonal IUS in as much as the method is not widely available because the Ministry of Health, especially the HIS uh, uh, staff were involved from the onset, we've been able to actually disaggregate IUD. Hence now we will be able to track how many clans are actually taking hormonal IUS compared to the non-hormonal copper, copper IUD. Again, partnership and coordination in all that we are doing to avoid uh, overlap, but more importantly, to create synergies in what we, we've been doing among the partners. And lastly, through MSI's effort, we've had an additional product, the Avibella, that has been licensed within Kenya. So far, next, that's it for now. It's been exciting, and we are looking forward to continuing this work. Over to you, Kate. Great, thank you so much, Susan. And um, we're gonna ask you and the other presenters to stay for a Q&A. So please, um, for those of you who haven't posted your comments, please put them in the chat. Um, I'm just gonna end the slides by giving a shout out to the new, um, a new knowledge sharing platform, the Hormonalios Access Portal that we launched uh, middle of last year. And what's really exciting about this is it's intended to be a one-stop shop for um, resources related to hormonal IS introduction in um, low and middle income countries, including the emerging evidence. So um, I know there is was a question, a couple of questions about data on um, bleeding changes, and we're going to hopefully talk about that. We did have um, uh, in June 2020, a two-day technical consultation uh, where we looked at data and findings across uh, countries and studies, and one of the questions we looked at was bleeding preferences. So I'm going to put in the in a second the the link to where you can find the slides for that. We wanted to focus today's presentation more on process, but there are a lot of rich data coming out of these settings that I um, will point you to, and I know uh, pu publications are in development. Um, so I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do is do a little bit of facilitation with the with the questions we've received. Um, and maybe what I'll do is um, say three questions <laughs> for one for um, uh, Anna and Tabitha, one for Jim, and then one one for Susan. Um, so so Anna and um, Tabitha, a question has come up in the chat about um, how kind of phase one and phase two countries are decided and how that process is refreshed. And then if you can also talk a little bit about sustainability of supply um, so that we don't get into a situation where demand outstrips supply, which I know you both mentioned. So um, maybe you all can address that. Jim, I know you already um, responded in the chat, but since some people don't have access to the chat, I think uh, Ricky's question about what the um, ICA Foundation's strategic vision is moving forward as we hopefully see the method being added to procurement cladoglogs, I think would be great to address. And then Susan, I thought maybe you and I could both um, talk a little bit more about um, the data that we're seeing coming out regarding um, bleeding changes, and particularly, I think, the question about um, uh, 
how women perceive reduced bleeding or amenorrhea that many women sometimes um, in the settings where we work might be concerned that lack of bleeding um, means that they're pregnant or have other concerns. So Susan, if you um, can speak to that, and I can also talk a little bit about the data that we've seen out of the LEAP study. So um, Anna and Tabitha, can I hand it to you first? Maybe Anna, do you wanna talk about the phase one, phase two, and then, okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Kate, and thank you for the question. Um, so maybe if I just start with um, a bit on the our approach to country phasing and then hand to Tabitha um, to cover the question around sustainability. Um, so, I mean, as yeah, we mentioned in our presentation, um, really at the heart of our strategy is this need to make sure that um, demand, uh, especially in the early stages, doesn't outstrip supply. Um, and that is why we have aligned on this focused and phased strategy. Um, and I mentioned that we have um, some initial countries that are in our, um, what we call our phase one group. Um, and these, as I mentioned, are essentially countries with really strong Ministry of Health interest um, and are really kind of primed to introduce the product um, now when they get their hands on, on product, when the product becomes available. Um, we have also been through a process of thinking through uh, kind of second and third phase countries as well, um, using various different criteria um, as an access group. Um, and so we have a number of countries um, which we're considering to be phase two. Um, and this is really based um, upon a number of criteria, including um, kind of potential interest from ministries. Um, there may be um, product registrations underway. Um, there could be uh, existing donor funding that could be used to support um, product introduction. Um, but it may be that um, not all of these criteria are in place, as is the case with our phase one countries. Um, and we also have phase three countries that we have discussed um, and kind of aligned on initially. And these are countries which may have expressed an interest but may um, not have a LARC focus in their setting um, and where there could also be a risk that uh, initial demand could outstrip supply. So for more information on the specific countries that are included um, within each of these buckets, you can find um, more information out by getting in touch with the IUS access portal. Um, but just to say that we're really live to the fact that um, these uh, country contexts are changing and evolving and it's important that we regularly refresh our understanding of which countries are in which bucket. Um, it may be that um, particular countries are actually uh, considering, to add, considering adding the product to their method mix and really interested to find out more um, about uh, what products might be available and how we can think through an introduction strategy. And so recognizing that as an access group, we have committed to reviewing the country phasing on a quarterly basis, um, as and when as well, um, information becomes available to the, to the access group via our partners group. Um, so, so yeah, for more information, definitely reach out via that email for the IUS access portal. Um, but yeah, just to say that these, these phasings are important, but we're also reviewing them on a very um, regular basis to make sure that we're not being too uh, constricted. I'll hand over to Tab now to cover the sustainability question. Sure. Um, so as I, you mentioned in you know, 2015, when we started to think about this, it was the first time when uh, sort of the price point of a product was approaching um, uh, an amount that we could consider uh, for public sector um, procurement. And that's what's coming with this announcement from uh, hopefully in the next couple of months, uh, very soon from UNFPA, from USAID, and that um, this sort of groundswell of activity, we will have a um, public sector price that is in uh, sort of range of what um, other products are for that duration. So. Um, it's going to be quite a bit different than what it's been over the past, you know, 10, 15 years that makes it feasible um, and a, a sustainable option um, uh, as in, in the method mix for these countries. Um, however, uh, I think there continues to be work done in this space to get um, prices down for supply. And also we need to acknowledge that the unit price for those products is just one component of introducing within a country, of course, all the other uh, uh, pieces need to be put into place. And that's part of what this um, coordination effort is, is here to do to make sure that we are pulling from the different, 
either government resources and donors, et cetera, to make this a, a, a successful effort. But it's a, it's a continuing um, conversation and it is actually evolving quite rapidly over the past year or two. Um, but thank you for that. Was, was there a second piece to that, Kate? Uh, you got it, Tab. I think, think between uh, the two of those, we covered it. So thank you. That was a really helpful summary. Um, Jim, do you want to, can you speak to, again, what the, you envision the role of the ICA Foundation playing as the landscape continues to evolve? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, we've just undergone a strategic planning effort. We're actually in, the, in, in not all the way through with it, and, and we will be at our spring meeting uh, of the foundation board, be confirming uh, and then uh, publicizing uh, our, uh, some, some uh, decisions that we've made. But what I can say is that the primary goal of the foundation, which is to uh, distribute, uh, and the, the model is to distribute to local programs uh, at no cost uh, and for them to um, uh, work with clients uh, to offer the product, uh, that, that primary mission is going to continue. Um, in fact, uh, if, uh, we, as you've noted, we have a little bit of a, a down uh, surge in requests this year. Uh, so if there are people and, uh, who are clinicians who are representing projects uh, in uh, lower and middle income countries, uh, you should feel free to uh, uh, apply to the ICA Foundation. Um, and I'm uh, pasting the, uh, the website there. You should do that. The procedures are, are right there. It's a pretty simple uh, application. Uh, what I will say is that, that we're very interested and we're paying attention very carefully to, to the donor strategies and where they are going. We're, we're pleased that we, we think we may have had some role in helping to prepare the market for the much larger uh, introduction that's going on uh, in, in some of these countries. Um, but we also, I think the board was also uh, pretty uh, firm in thinking that, that there are uh, lots of need, even in countries that are not the biggest countries, around and the, the most needed, there's still a lot of need. And, and I would point to our Latin America projects, uh, most, uh, many of which uh, are through IPPF, uh, some of which are through ESAR uh, as well, that uh, really uh, show very, very strong legs and strong demand for this, uh, uh, for this method. And I think there's a strong interest in our, uh, on our board to kind of continue supporting uh, uh, projects like that. Uh, so our, our future is going to be uh, one where we would like to continue doing what we're doing, uh, continue helping to uh, seed and start and, and foster uh, uh, some, uh, some very small projects that, that might not be on the radar screen of some others uh, and try to support those in, into making them uh, uh, bigger and, and more significant. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. That's really exciting. Um, Susan, can I turn it to you? Um, we got some questions both about perceptions of bleeding changes at the hormonal IOS as well as um, the methods, uh, non-contraceptive health benefits. So I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about your experience in Kenya. So uh, to respond to the question about follow-up, we were able to follow up 63% of the women who had uh, enrolled into the study. And we did the follow-up interviews an average of five months after insertion. And later on, we also did uh, qualitative interviews with providers who had been offering this method. And one of the things they mentioned was uh, women were really excited about the, non, the fact that uh, this method confirmed the reduced bleeding. So that was one of the biggest sellers towards women, since most of them will come and say the fact that they've experienced uh, you know, reduced bleeding is something positive towards them. The other thing was also, there's a question that was asked about the differences. We didn't see actually any differences in terms of the participant characteristic between those who chose uh, the hormonal IUS and uh, the COPA D. The only small difference was in terms of age. Women who, and who most, were more likely to choose hormonal IUS were slightly younger compared to the ones who chose uh, the non-hormonal COPA UD precisely. Thank you so much, Susan. And I'll just jump in. Um, we didn't have time to talk about it today, but we have been doing uh, FHI 360 and PSI, um, have been collaborating with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to do, to conduct uh, longitudinal studies in, in uh, Nigeria and Zambia among hormonal IUS users. And uh, one of the things we've seen there is that um, reasons for choosing the method uh, 
are usually consistent across larks, including effectiveness, long long duration of use, um, and that. But we do see among hormonal IUS users uh, that the reduced potential for reduced bleeding and the potential for treatment uh, for heavy bleeding as um, reasons for choosing the method. And then once women um, have have tried the method for up to 12 months, that 20 to 30 percent of them are saying that uh, their experiences with re reduced or no bleeding is one of their perceived advantages. And again, uh, I'm just looking at my notes here, six to 24 percent of those them are seeing the potential for treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding as an advantage. So we do, this is something, uh, the, the effects on bleeding is something that we're really um, uh, focus on and again have a have additional publications and data coming out. Um, I'll also say that last in November of 2020 we convened a separate meeting focused on contraceptive induced menstrual changes and I'll post uh, the the slides and the recordings um, are available from that event as well and I can post those in the in the chat. So we're almost at time. I'm going to hand, unfortunately, there's some more great questions and comments coming in, but I think that we need to wrap up. Um, I just, again, want to thank the meeting organizers for including us, um, including this global perspective in the discussion. And Ricky, I will hand it back to you. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much uh, uh, for <clears throat> an excellent uh, discussion, both uh, uh, on uh, uh, virtual as well as through the chat box. I think there's a couple more questions, as you mentioned, that uh, are coming in. And so we'll try to respond to that one. So in the last uh, uh, couple of minutes for this uh, session, I'd like to just uh, uh, ask Alexa to stop uh, uh, broadcasting. Uh, Alexa, stop. I don't know why it uh, came online. But one is the uh, we've heard today is really quite uh, uh, exciting in terms of the insights coming in from the Choice Project, the uh, FP Elevated, as well as a snapshot of what's going on in terms of improving access using postpartum family planning in uh, uh, a couple of low middle income countries. And equally also exciting is the opportunity to expand uh, 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 the method choices that are available to women in low resource setting uh, uh, with the use of LNG IUS, although uh, it's been available to us for the last uh, 30 years, uh, it's better late than never and, and being able to uh, offer that to women uh, uh, and improve their <clears throat> choice and address their preferences when it comes to a particular uh, contraceptive method. So before I, uh, 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 next slide, Rachel, please. So um, a couple of things to say is, is one is to just uh, thank uh, very much our uh, uh, excellent uh, resource speakers uh, today. Uh, uh, it's been a, a wonderful opportunity to work with you in, in the lead up to this presentation, as well as uh, in, in the uh, execution of, of the, uh, the session uh, itself. Also to uh, the committee members uh, organizing this, and and of course our uh, uh, supporters who are funding this opportunity for everyone. But most of all, I think it's the uh, participants who have stayed with us and 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 continued to uh, uh, pay attention to uh, uh, one of the methods that is highly effective but really under uh, uh, utilized. So just a couple of uh, 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 announcements, which is for those who are interested in, in securing CME uh, uh, is, is that uh, there is an evaluation after this session. And then uh, last but not the least is to let everyone know that uh, we our next event is coming online on March 3rd, 2021. And it's about uh, level one evidence, validating observational studies and non-contraceptive attributes uh, uh, of IUDs. So looking forward to uh, seeing you all again uh, in March. And for now, thank you very much for uh, uh, your time and your interest.